So I teach music at uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and I also teach some psychology. Um, but in addition to this, I, I'm a jazz bass player and I'm a composer. So in this talk today, I'm going to speak on how the brain processes mainstream popular music, kind of like this. Yeah, the truth is. And also some more hardcore music, kind of like this. Okay, <laughs> wait a minute. I thought this was an evening rendezvous talk, and here I am up here comparing Coldplay and death metal. How did that happen? So in an earlier life, I used to play a lot of difficult experimental music, primarily to audiences of other jazz musicians. And to give you a sense of what I mean here, it's a little bit similar to a Pepe's uh, music in the background, but a little more harsh and strident. OK, so I love this stuff. I still do. Uh, I find it wild and imaginative and free. But to a lot of my friends, they heard the same music as cacophony. This was just noise. One friend called this dying animal music. <laughs> so one thing I noticed early on was that behind these judgments was, also, was often an implicit sort of moral undertone that went a little something like this. This music is clearly bad for you. It's unintelligible. What's someone like you doing listening to this, performing it? <laughs> oh, you know, this isn't, this isn't good for you. Uh, what does it say about you that you like it? <laughs> And these experiences vividly illustrated to me very early the social entanglements of everyday music listening, that a breakdown of empathy for music can sometimes betoken a breakdown of empathy for the people who are making it. Now, this got me wondering, how does music relate to our social world? What does it tell us about how we perceive those around us? And this line of questioning eventually landed me circuitously and with a lot of help from a bunch of great psychologists in this position of being jazz musician turned scientist. Peering into the brain with powerful new tools can help us unlock some of the most ancient questions in music and the mind. And over the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to explore a couple of these questions together. But first, we have to go back in time. You probably weren't expecting to go this far back in time. So these two flutes are the oldest musical instruments in the archaeological record. They predate the Lascaux cave paintings in France by about 10,000 years or so. Uh, and they're made of these bones of these now extinct cave uh, Ice Age mammals. Oh, and I forgot to mention, the second flute there, the one you're listening to, this wasn't even made by human hands. This is a product of Neanderthal culture. What do these instruments, these prehistoric instruments, tell us about the human and even pre-human obsession with music. Why do we make music at all? This might seem like a kind of facetious question, but actually the answer is far from clear. And uh, thinkers for millennia have been grappling with this. So I want to establish a few baseline facts here as we move into this question. First of all, in addition to being ancient, as we just saw, music is a human universal, meaning that every known human society makes a recognizable form of music. Second, music appears very early in human development. Already within a week or two, infants are capable of vocalizing, imitating their parents' vocal gestures. It's also quite expensive. And by this, I don't mean all the money you spent on a Beyonce ticket a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm referring to the fact that when we're making music, we're not gathering food. We're not sleeping. We're not doing things that are very important to us biologically. So. This presents us with a quandary, right? Usually these three characteristics are associated with behaviors that have really obvious adaptive value that arose through evolutionary pressures over long spans of time. Not so music. In fact, the cognitive scientist Steven Pinker tried to explain the universal popularity of music as essentially just a harmless hedonic pastime. He called it auditory cheesecake, and he didn't win many fans among musicians when he did this. But is that all music is? Is it just something that's pleasurable but ultimately kind of frivolous from a biological perspective? Charles Darwin weighed in on this almost 150 years ago. He wrote, as neither the enjoyment nor the capacity of producing musical notes are faculties of the least use to man, we must 
Uh, they must be ranked amongst the most mysterious with which he is endowed. Luckily for us, using the tools of modern science, we're beginning to develop some plausible theories as to this mysterious human obsession with music. And some of the more compelling recent theories to emerge here uh, regarding music's biological purpose has to do with its social powers. As Aristotle reminds us, of course, man is a social animal. And there's reason to believe that music might be a really crucial ingredient in our innate sociality as humans, as acknowledged here by the late neurologist Oliver Sacks. So music works as a social cement in many, many ways. For example, as every teenager knows, music is, is often quite good at allowing us to develop and to maintain social bonds, right? Increasing cohesion and uh, social solidarity. Related to this, it's really quite effective at group coordination. Imagine field workers plowing and singing together at the same time to the same song or soldiers marching in step, or dancers coordinating their bodies to the same beat. There's also reason to believe that some of our most precious oral histories and traditions, like Homeric epics, uh, were originally passed down generation to generation through song. So if humans are social animals, what trait do we possess that showcases this sociality perhaps better than any other? The quintessential human social trait is empathy. Empathy is what allows us to see the world from another's point of view. It allows us to feel what other people are feeling. If you think about it, it's hard to imagine understanding other minds at all without empathy. We also know that empathy varies quite a bit from individual to individual. It is not evenly distributed amongst the population, as we know very well looking at the news. <laughs> so seeing that the prevailing view is that homo sapiens developed these huge brains and parts to help us manage this dizzyingly complex social environment, it stands to reason that sociality, empathy, and musicality might all be related. And some of the greatest minds ever have been on to this connection. I'm, this is in no way original to me. For instance, Shakespeare in uh, Merchant of Venice has this to say. <clears throat> the man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. Let no such man be trusted. Mark the music. Excuse the accent. <laughs> so I want to pivot now uh, to some work I've been doing with my team uh, lately on this topic. And we were interested in this particular question. Do highly empathic people actually process music differently in the brain compared to people who have lower empathy? Specifically here, we are curious to look at how higher empathy people really treat music on the neural level, whether they treat music as a kind of imaginary or virtual human presence, which, would be, uh, which we'd be able to see in uh, activity in areas of the brain that are associated with more general purpose social processing. If so, this might indicate that the processes are related. So to test this hypothesis, I teamed up with some uh, colleagues at UCLA a few years ago who were also curious about this, and we designed a study. We were looking at music in these four conditions, stuff people know and do not know, and music that they say they love, 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 versus music they can't stand. OK, so they brought in their own music. We also had them do this commonly used test measuring individual differences in empathy. Then we put them in a scanner. They listened to a bunch of music. And we were interested in looking at what areas of the brain actually go up or down in activity according to individual differences in empathy. That is, areas that are more responsive to music amongst these higher empathy people compared to lower empathy. And uh, this was published just earlier this year. So now we're going to look at a few brain scans. And I, I want to start out by asking a very simple question. What's going on in your brain when you're listening to music you love versus music you can't stand? Now, to explain these here, these are horizontal slices of the brain at different locations. And those colored blobs you see is a brain activation as, as reflected in blood flow change to that specific region. What you're seeing here should not surprise you at all. When you listen to music that you love, we see activity in this red blob here, this is the reward center of the brain. Okay? This is the exact same area that's involved in lots of type of pleasure responses, including eating fatty foods. I was going to say uh, cheesecake, but that would have been in poor taste. Um, by way of contrast, when we're listening to music that you can't stand at all, we see activation in areas 
of the limbic and paralimbic system that are associated quite strongly with emotional types of reactions. And these specific structures here have also been really shown to be involved in a lot of negative type, types of responses. But this tells us nothing at all about empathy. How do individual differences in empathy actually modulate how we process music? And to answer that question, I want to take a very brief tour into the brain of highly empathic people when they're listening to familiar music. As we dive into the brain here of highly empathic people, we see a number of regions that are exquisitely sensitive to music that appear just in these people who are higher empathy, not in the lower empathy people. What does this actually mean? Well, from the top of the brain to the bottom, or left right here, we found in this, in this study that uh, higher empathy people show greater activation in, in areas associated with executive function and cognitive control. This is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The reward areas, as we just saw a little, little earlier, so these are areas associated with pleasure and reward. Also, and this is significant in these slides here, certain areas that have been implicated in many studies as essential to processing social information. These are areas of the medial prefrontal cortex. We also found greater activation in emotion centers. And also, much to our surprise, preferential engagement of, this, of a particular visual area, the lingual gyrus, which could be interpreted to suggest that maybe people who are higher empathy actually maybe experience more visual imagery or things like this when they're listening. But that's speculative. So I want to close my talk tonight with just three big takeaway points here. First of all, we know that high empathy people engage more social parts of the brain when they're observing others, engaging with other people, even thinking about other people. And some of these exact same areas, very interesting to us, are active when they listen to music, which suggests to us that music might be perceived as kind of an imaginary or a virtual human presence. If this is the case, music isn't just an object of aesthetic appreciation uh, that you just put on and passively listen to. It's also kind of a proxy for a social encounter. Second, and getting back to some of the earlier evolutionary theories that opened this talk tonight, it's plausible that music may have piggybacked on neural architecture that originally evolved for social interaction. Specifically, our ability to harmonize with other people. Simply put, music might be, evolutionarily speaking, about us connecting with others. And finally, this suggests to us that music may be intimately connected to the most quintessential of social capacities, the human aptitude for empathy. Now, this raises many questions. For example, if empathy modulates how we process music, as this particular study seems to imply, could the inverse also be true? Could music alter our capacity to empathize with others? And this question remains to be explored. So in conclusion, there's so much that we don't know about this music empathy connection. And this small little project I've just gone over here is really just an overture to a larger symphony that's being uh, written right now by researchers at the intersection of music and psychology. These are really exciting times to be both a musician and a scientist. Modern brain science is helping us explore some of the most ancient questions in the psychology of the arts. Thank you very much. <laughs>